Hello, this is part B, the diff going through different components for the sort of basic introduction to aspects of deep learning. And uh, we previously did lesson A, which gave you some examples. And I say lesson B starting here, go through these <coughs> components. And that's what this says here. This is the start of lesson B. And we first start off this with an actual list of the components and links to find them. Activation layers, loss functions, what you actually minimize or optimize. The method of the optimization, which is well, stochastic gradient descent. Back propagation to calculate the gradient. One hop vector to represent results. The difficulty when gradients get very small or vanish. The importance of hyperparameters, which define the network, and you need to find the best possible network in a class of networks. And finally, lay the uh, value of label smoothing. Okay, here we come to activation functions. And there's a whole set of links here. And um, there are lots of choices here, which are sort of partly folklore. And they partly are motivated by the type of problem you're solving. Now, if we take um, a neural net, which is abstracted here, we have neurons. This is a neuron. Then we have weights coming into the neurons. And <coughs> these weights are propagated from a previous neuron. So you take the weight of the link, the value of the previous neuron, then you add them all up, and then you add a so-called bias B. That gives you the argument of this neuron. The activation function converts the argument into a value, the thing that corresponds to x0 here. And then we have various choices. The simplest is function of x equals x. You just sum the take w of i, sum of i, w of i, x i plus b is the answer. Um, and, but there are much, there are some more sophisticated um, choices, which are typically the ones used because they get the best answers. And they produce an essential nonlinearity, which is believed to be one of the big reasons for the success of neural nets. And here is a picture of a, of a, of a neuron, a nucleus with these uh, dendrites, which are the weights hanging off them in a, in a real brain. So here we go to this uh, definition here from deepai.org. And it more or less says what I said. And um, it points out again that they're nonlinear. And there are lots of choices. And um, they always act on the weighted sum plus the bias. And um, the activation function is the same for all neurons in a layer. And the net result is critical and is actually a, a place you sort of view the state, that particular stage is ending. And you construct uh, deep learning networks as a bunch of uh, networks, activation layer, gap, that's the end of that uh, stage. Then you have another bunch of network, uh, another, those produce outputs which go to the next. Uh, stage of the neural net and so on. Here is uh, the rectified linear unit, which is actually linear if the number is positive, and zero otherwise. And of course, this has uh, some interesting properties which could be, which can actually come back to bite you. They're very well behaved up here if the argument's positive. Is the derivative is this continuous to the origin? And the derivative is zero. And that <coughs> too many zeros give you a problem. And that we come back to on the vanishing um, gradient problem. OK, here is a bit more detail on the RELU from the deepai.org resource. It's, this, of course, defines lots of topics. I've just selected a few. And it points out the sigmoid and um, tenth, which will come to. Um, have these, they, they level off at, at infinity, and that, that leveling off corresponds to a vanishing of the derivative. 
RELU does have a vanishing derivative if the argument's negative or very at all negative. However, for positive values, it's got a linear derivative. So it, it actually can be used um, more safely, although it's not, ob it's not obvious to me that the vanishing gradient can't occur if you have a lot of negative values going on. But anyway, it sounds as though it's, it's okay. Sigmoid is a famous one, and you can see why it's nice and elegant. It really puts all the action for small values, and it just removes anything happening for large values. I pointed out a problem this has for, say, earthquakes, where the energy can vary by factors of a million, and you can't, so you can't even represent that with sigmoid functions. Sigmoid is defined as one over one plus e to the minus x, and um, it goes for x goes to minus infinity. It goes to uh, to zero for x goes to positive infinity. It goes to one, and so it's a nice, a simple function. Okay, and it looks like the shape looks a bit like a Greek sigma, which you can see here. This is the sigmoid function. Tenth is I don't think has independent significance. Because tenth of x is two sigma of two x minus one, you just um, mess around with these exponentials. It's the hyperbolic uh, tenth function, and of course it has to have the same general shape because it's a simple function of the sigmoid thing, multiplied by two and subtracting one, and it goes uh, from minus one to plus one. And if you remember, uh, the sigmoid went from zero to one. So this is where you want the asymptotic values to. Go from minus one to plus one, which is probably a more typical choice for general numbers. But again, I say that you can see why you have a vanishing derivative problem. Up here, nothing happens. And so if a value, if a sum of wi xi plus b is in this general region, you're not going to get a useful derivative. Because you have to really jump it from here to here to get any action. Softmax is used when you want to uh, calculate probabilities of different options like apple, bear, candy, dog, or egg. These are five different options, whether it's yes, no for that. And the thing gives you outputs a probability for each of these five choices. And because the x's are the um, normally calculated values, you just replace them by this function. So it's called a softmax. E to the minus x over sum of e to the minus x. Where x are the input values. So now we come to loss functions. And <clears throat> the loss is what we mean. Remember, I had a long discussion of optimization. Well, the loss function is what you're optimizing. And we even discussed that in. Um, in that long section, and in fact, this section is, if you like, a summary of that. So the loss function is what you're minimizing, and stochastic gradient descent is the way you're is the way you're doing that minimization. Say so that is not the way you do other minimizations. It's the way you need to do here to get the best performance. And there are good reasons why, for problems like this with huge numbers of parameters, uh, this approach is a very effective approach. It's interesting. It's, it was established quite early on in the theory of, of neural nets, and it, it, its dominance has not really changed. There's some tweaks on the on its uh, heuristic implementation, but that's it. Uh, we have so-called regularization methods. These are to smooth out the optimization function so it uh, doesn't do bad things like stick you in local minima, and also tries to avoid overfitting, which is um, when you have too many parameters and too few data, the parameters exactly match the data. But then when you come along with new data, that exact matching you pay a price for, because it means you haven't really generalized the function. You've just exactly learned what you were given. Whereas you really would like to have more uh, training data than parameters, so the parameters average over a lot of the data. Maximum likelihood, we also discussed under optimization. It's a well-known method 
which is very important, and, but still very old. I used to teach that back when I taught uh, statistics in the late 80s at Caltech. It's a very old method, much older than that date. And it um, it's a typically one of the, the theory of the of what you're doing often leads you to a maximum likelihood uh, estimate. And you nearly always put a minus sign in front of it, because you really would prefer to minimize rather than maximize. But uh, that's a sort of triviality. Um, <clears throat> here we have and some more comments for what are the loss function. Well, here is one you'd use for sort of uh, categorization where the answers are zero or one. Uh, you just put the loss equal to naught if they're equal, and one if they're not equal, and you want to try to make the indicator loss to be zero. A quadratic loss, which is what you typically get to with least squares formalization, is just the difference of the observed value. I mean, y hat is the, sorry, the estimated value and the true value, or the trained value, squared. I mean, this is a really, again, classic old thing. Now, it, the function you'll get in least squares is the sum of least squares, because the loss function is typically the sum of the components of the loss functions of the different parts. All right, so um, we use cross entropies when you use the principle of maximum likelihood. That's the classic formula. Often the likelihood is in some limit, uh, an exponential of minus the MSE, the mean squared error, or some constant times it. And um, this gives you the loss functions that look like this, because this is the log of the likelihood, or rather minus the log of the likelihood. And um, so likelihood and least squares are closely related. When you come to convolutional networks and recurrent networks, you get the pretty complicated formulae. That's why you tend to use automatic differentiation to calculate gradients of these messy functions. However, in all cases, uh, this is even true in chi-squared, the uh, total loss is the sum over data points of the loss from each data point. The loss from each data point could be pretty messy. It doesn't have to be some linear function like this. But the, the total loss is the sum over data points of the loss per data point. All right, so here we have a discussion of stochastic gradient descent, which I consider a pretty remarkable discovery. It's not terribly intuitive. Um, but it's uh, an important approach to optimization. Um, steepest descent, which I used to teach at the very beginning of time, is very old. And actually, when I taught it, it did not have a good reputation. The brilliant people who invented stochastic gradient descent rejuvenated steepest descent. Um, the steepest descent has always gotten, in fact, the reason why it's used in stochastic gradient descent is that if you are, have a function L, which is the loss function, and you look at the gradient of that, the L, the alpha P, where alpha P are the variables it depends on, then L will decrease the most if you go in this direction. It's the direction of maximum slope. If you're on a hill, you can go, go on the peak of the hill, that's that way. But there is a direction which is the steepest ascent direction, which is the which is the L D alpha P. And I say so if you want to go a particular small step size eta, you'll get the greatest bang for your eta or buck if you go in the steepest ascent direction. So the first idea is steepest ascent. Now the trouble with steepest ascent, it tended to get stuck in local minima. Because uh, it just went straight down and then got to a minimum. But it rarely was the right minimum. So it was never, essentially never used initially. However, it was noticed that um, <coughs> you can do the stochastic idea. Namely, you take this loss function here and you approximate it in a statistical fashion by instead of taking the sum over all losses and dividing by. Um, or the number of uh, data points, you take a sample called the batch, which might be 100 or 500 points, and you calculate the same thing, but you, you calculate only B points, and you put a 1 over B here, not a 1 over D. 
Notice there's a so-called central limit there, which says that these things actually have the same limit. And uh, it's okay to do this. And so what happens is you, you replace L by something which approximates L, and it jiggles around. And then jiggling around, because you do L and lots of approximations, sum up as a bunch of approximations and calculate the shift from each approximation, that allows you to jump around. And you hopefully will not get stuck in the local minimum. That's a clever idea, in my opinion. Quite deep. Um, now, an epoch is when you actually run over all d values. So when you do stochastic gradient descent, you first randomize all the points, because you don't want to have any correlation so that you have a batch where all are the same or something. So you randomize them, and then suppose we had a 5 million D points and 500 in our batch size, we would use 100,000 batches and we would just apply the 100,000 batches. And applying all those batches is called an epoch. And typically you need 10 to 100 epochs. And people will draw you a plot of the change of the loss function uh, as a function of epoch to show that you've converged. Here I point out the central limit theorem. And you have, there's a so-called learning rate. Now, learning rate is pretty flaky because you don't actually know what the right learning rate is. Again, think of your hill. Well, we know if we go for a very small shift, we're going to actually go down. However, if the shift gets too big, well, we'll actually, if it was a hill, we would go and drill a hole in the hill. Because as soon as the hill curved, we would go straight into that, that curve. Um, if also, if there was a cliff, we would jump off the cliff and die. Uh, well, that would be very bad, would it not? So eta is pretty difficult. And uh, actually, most more sophisticated um, optimization methods try to estimate eta. If you use Newton's method, the second order method, that estimates an eta. But the, because this is a linear formalism, you don't have any estimate for eta. So you have to just Play around, put in an eta, and then just use it. But it's quite likely that your value of eta is going to be off by um, a fact, pretty large factor, and so you probably affect your convergence. Uh, in AlexNet, the most famous initial one, eta is 0.01. So it's a small number. And then you can move it uh, in some sort of heuristic way as the as the procedure goes. And um, in the case of AlexNex, they actually divided it by 10 three times. So that's just saying that <coughs> when you have a, when you're having difficulties, you really don't want to do a large jump because you're bound to run into trouble. Now momentum is a different idea. Eta is decreasing the shift to guarantee convergence. Momentum is taking your your point, your shift, and you calculate. So remember, you have an, an old shift, which is the sum of which comes from all the previous um, batches. Now you have a new shift from this batch. Well, you don't actually shift in this new shift direction. You take the old shift um, times the old, you know, the old met shift. You multiply by momentum, which can actually be as big as 0.9. So you take 90% of your shift and make it to be the previous value. And then you decrease eta, say, by another factor of 10, and you add on your new shift. So this says that um, you're trying to not change too rapidly. Of course, this slows down convergence, but the idea is the convergence will be much more reliable. Um, another possibility you want to do is to just let the weight, uh, weight decline with a weight decay factor, which is this very small number. And um, you just for, take the shift to be actually a small, this very small number times the original value of alpha. So you effectively are declining alpha. I'm not certain that weight decay is such a well-established principle. Notice I used, I once described heuristic. These are all heuristics. There's no mathematics, as far as I know, behind this. 
There is a deep mathematics behind stochastic gradient descent, which is the central limit theorem, which says it's actually asymptotically gives the right answer. That's deep mathematics, but this screwing around with momentum and eta and weight decay is heuristics. You just fool around to, with sensible things, which you have to actually, this is an example of a hyperparameter. You have to play around with these parameters to get the right answer. And there are also a whole bunch of methods which are more sophisticated, and they actually do it not. This, these, are, these number parameters here, eta, w, d, and m, uh, do not depend on the parameter value. But there are other methods which look at the nature of the parameters, because some parameters can be much more important than other parameters. And these are called Adagrad, RMS prop, and Adam. And these are options you can use to change the uh, gradient descent algorithm. And here is an example of one where you actually normalize the shift according to the typical value of this uh, function. So here is the step size from the previous value. So you basically you, you, you use the typical shifts to actually normalize the decay. And um, as I say, Adagrad and Adam are uh, similar related ideas, and they are typically used. I think I think they typically give better answers, and it is plausible. I mean, of course, often you try to um, use whitening, which is to try to make all the parameters have the same standard deviation and actually have the same impact. But this, if you like, is related to whitening, but uh, is much more dynamic and related to the actual derivative. Whereas light whitening is related just to the values and correlations of the functions, of the parameters. Okay, here we have a typical neural net. And it's a set of layers. And if we look at, say, this layer here, um, the signals here with the, the x's in these neurons, which are going to be multiplied by these weights later on, they're a function, which here I call g, of the signals from layer two, and so on. The layer two is a function of layer one, and the output layer is another different function, depending on the activation you have there from layer three, the hidden layer. So this is function of a function of a function of a function. Well, that's called the chain rule. The d by dx of a function of g of x is d by the g of f, the natural thing to differentiate f with respect to, of d by the x of g. And x has to run over weights and biases, everything that you're training. And you just have to apply that in a, a hierarchical fashion across this multi-layer network. And that is called backpropagation. Sometimes people worship backpropagation. As far as I know, backpropagation is just mathematics what you have to do to do a differentiation. So it's not backpropagation that does anything, it's differentiation, which is steepest descent that really does something. That's the idea. Backpropagation is just the engineering of calculating it. Um, so if we have here a little more precisely, the output is uh, F4 of F3 of F2 of F1 of the inputs. Then um, we let G say to be the these parts of it, and f to be f4, then this thing here is f of this g thing. And so to calculate the derivatives, we have to start here at the output, and then we work back. So that's why it's called back propagation. And there are automatic ways of doing this, as you might expect. This is so well defined that you can automatically do the differentiation. It's not something you really want to do by hand, but you can of course do it by hand. One hop vectors is a simple idea of uh, using binary representations. So suppose that we had something which we're going to train, and it could be a horse, a cat, a bus, a frog. Well, we could make horse equals one, cat equals two, bus equals three, frog equals four, and we're training it to be those numbers. Alternatively, we could use vectors, binary vectors. Horse in the first direction, cat in the second, bus in the third, frog in the fourth. 
So this is just by definition the one hot representation. And typically, this type of representation, although it seems less efficient, ends up turning out to be a better way to go and gets better answers than the more obvious method here. That's, that's been known from the beginning of time, even in the 80s when I first started working in this area. I, I mentioned this already, the vanishing gradient property problem, I should say. And here is the DBAI citation. And basically, it comes from the, if you like, it's a, it doesn't come from back propagation because back propagation is calculating the answer. The problem is the cascade function in back propagation. If it runs through, a, say, a sigmoid where everything is very, derivatives are small, then what happens is the, the resultant derivative is tiny. Um, but then you have to multiply it by numbers. You have to do bigger steps and things like that. But that becomes very unreliable. So that's why we mentioned you try to choose activation layers that don't lead to this problem. And RELU had the property that although we get rigorously zero derivative in some circumstances, in other circumstances, namely if the argument was positive, it had a wonderful derivative. Um, <coughs> And the various approaches to this is to um, um, use RERUs, we mentioned residual networks, which effectively jump over bad net over these things that give vanishing derivatives. And the other one is multi-level, you train a layer at a time. I think it's viewed as much better to do this. Although the residual networks are also pretty powerful on general principles. They have long distance connections that keeps everything coupled together and more likely to give a reliable answer. Because remember, I mentioned in the, when discussing recurrent networks, there's something called attention, which is the long distance memory. You must have that. Hyperparameters are pretty interesting. So uh, you have lots of parameters, just the overall structure of the network is a parameter. The number of layers is a parameter. Using one hot or not is a parameter. Batch size is a parameter. Eta, the learning rate is parameters. Momentum is a parameter, et cetera, et cetera. And these are not like the training parameters. The training parameters are differentiable, the continuous functions, differentiable functions, and you use descent, calculate directions. Hyperparameters are not like that, they're choices. And the classic algorithm which does choices is actually a genetic algorithm. Remember, uh, when uh, humans are evolved, they're not evolving continuously with genes. Those genes just do a mutation and give it a try. And so the, this is a genetic algorithm introduced by Holland a long time ago, are a, a powerful way of doing these hyperparameter searches. But often they're not used, done by other methods, just by search methods and things like that. So hyperparameter searches are actually a, a very expensive, because I mean, if you have a network and you want to run, uh, um, I don't know, 100 possible choices of the parameters, that's 100 times the compute power needed. So hyperparameters are used extensively in industry, hyperparameter searches. And they use a, they're responsible for a huge amount of the computer time used in industry. And now we come to the last topic, label smoothing, where there's a paper here by Google in June. You know, we're at right today. This is 2019, and um, here is a Medium article on it. And the idea is that you don't train something to be a, actually a cat. You say this is a 90% cat. And uh, it turns out by letting of making that fuzzy, you tend to produce more precise answers. Um, and um, it, you just basically put in a loss function that allows a certain fuzziness in your training um, assignments. And here is the paper showing that uh, label smoothing, with one exception, gives better answers. Um, these are the, the bold answers is the best. Uh, but that for one particular measure, 
uh, for the, uh, I think this is a language problem. Uh, you get better answers without the, the uh, smoothing, but for every other case you do. Um, although they're not big effects, this is quite big, the uh, uh, Wall Street Journal uh, data set. So that's the end of this uh, section on cosmic things that you put together in deep learning networks. You see, it's pretty, I find it pretty interesting. There's lots of things to do. It's a much richer world than we used to have. We didn't used to have this idea that we had a bag of toolkits and we put this and 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 this. And that student does another set over there. It's a different world. Previously, mm, chi squared. Minimize it. Or decision tree or what have you. This is much, this has much more flexibility and I think is much more powerful and more interesting. So let's go for it. Thank you.